Hi, I'm Pat Van Levy. I'm a Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at the London School of Economics, and I'm one of the co-editors of the journal with David and Ava. In a recent article, you discussed the backlash against the state that has resulted from the global economic, economic crisis and outlined some possible future scenarios. Given the spread of grievances against governments in a number of contexts, do you see the backlash slowing down, only just beginning, or taking on new forms? Well, I think the interesting thing about the global financial crisis is how weak the global institutions were and how important states were in the coming up with any kind of rescue solution at all. And that has then uh, created kind of on implications, further implications, which have produced the sovereign debt crisis. And what the sovereign debt crisis also shows is, again, the weakness of institutions like the IMF and the European Union in terms of being able to bail out any kind of substantial state. They're fine with like microstates like Iceland. They get into trouble with uh, Ireland uh, and Greece, and they run into real difficulties if, if the crisis extends to a big state like Italy. So, you know, the state as a source of future tax revenues remains absolutely fundamental to the whole organization of the global polity, and that's the key lesson. Uh, and the backlash against the state is uh, really a kind of aversive reaction, especially by the Tea Party and the American far right, and now bits of the European far right, against the kind of forced recognition of dependence, if you see what I mean. So, that's, that's the argument. Thank you. In your co-authored exploration of the modern state, theories of the dem democratic state, you suggest that the state has answers for some of its most potent critiques. Yet, it could be argued that increasingly the state is exit in areas of social life. Where do you see this trend stopping? Well, of course, when you have a, a, a global financial crisis and then you have to do what we did in Britain, which is nationalise two-thirds of our banks and take on a huge raft of stabilisation expenditures, You've got to also do something about uh, areas where you uh, have been spending a lot of money and perhaps efficiency hasn't been so hot. And particularly in the, in the modern state, there's a huge potential to you know, use digital processes and save money and do different kinds of things. So I think that um, there hasn't really been a disengagement by the state. There's been a rolling back of some anachronistic functions and some areas that are not sustainable temporarily because of the, the global financial crisis. But uh, I don't see that the long-run share of GDP allocated to the state function is going to decline uh, in Britain, in any advanced industrialized country. And arguably, in America, uh, it, it may even increase. What do you think of arguments that the state is being eclipsed in importance by regional global blocks of allied or interdependent states? Well, it's a kind of strange argument to make at this point now because we're in a period of world history where we have some huge states that are you know, just going to dominate the global polity for the next uh, 50 years, 100 years at least. So China is, uh, so far, has remained you know, highly integrated. And, you know, a lot of administration is done at the provincial level in China. But um, nonetheless, the, the national state is a strong player in the world economy. And with a fifth of the world's population, it's not going to get any less. Similarly, India is becoming more uh, important. Um, the Indian state has certain structural weaknesses. But in terms of foreign policy and overall uh, position in the global policy field, it's, it's very important. So I think the, the other thing that you need to think about is, well, look at the European Union. It's not exactly in a period of, of nascent growth, and it, it can't be because it depends very much on the nation states. And uh, if, if they're not healthy, the European Union can't, can't do more. So I think the whole process is um, is still one that's absolutely dominated by states. And finally, one might even notice that the, the USA, which has 300 million people now, will have 500 million people by 2030. It is you know, going to have more people, there will be more people in the United States than there are in the whole of the European Union area, even as present constituted. Uh, so 
you know, the world is going to be dominated by some very big blocks, only one of which is uh, a, a block of several states, and three of which are blocks of just one state each. Thank you, Patrick. You have worked on what some term the second wave of digital era governance. Do you view increased online interaction with governments and policy makers as a sign of increasing engagement or alternatively estrangement between populations and their representatives? Well, we're in the middle of a revolution in how government is run and it's, it's not one that you can find very much written about in most political science textbooks, but essentially, you know, what is a state in the modern world? It is, it is actually just a, a system for collecting taxes, uh, and the better you do that, the stronger your state, and then distributing transfer payments, um, usually most of them going to health care and social security. So these are the dominant things that states do. They pull in money and then they distribute it again. Inherently that's a process that could be almost completely digital and is going, is, you know, we're just, we've had digital tax uh, assessment and digital tax processes for about 10 years. They're going to go and um, become very important. Social security systems are just moving online. The development of electronic health care will also tend to mean that the sort of physical service component will reduce. So increasing the future of the state is, a, is a, as a, a kind of governance system for a set of mega electronic financial and economic transactions. That's what states are nowadays. Thank you, Patrick. In a recent article, you discussed the backlash against the state that has resulted from the recent economic crisis, and you outlined some possible future scenarios. Given the spread of grievances against governments in a number of contexts, do you see the backlash slowing down, only just beginning, or taking on new forms? It's a really interesting question. I mean, in the, in the, in the 1960s, pluralist theorists used to say that the age of media barons was dead, and how wrong they were, because, you know, the period since then has seen a huge growth of uh, the importance of uh, media tycoons, particularly Rupert Murdoch with the News, Inter News Corp, and uh, particularly Berlusconi in uh, Italy, who became the Prime Minister, long-running Prime Minister, and founded his own political party. So tremendous uh, importance and salience of these strange, entrepreneurial, uh, flawed characters who've built up huge media empires. Uh, and I think the backlash against Rupert Murdoch in the UK very recently, and then some reverberations in the USA and Australia are an interesting indication of the fragility of that model. Okay, you know, these, these people can be very important, but the, you know, the, the political class doesn't really like them. The, the extent of the revulsion against Murdoch from all political parties in the UK has been very impressive. Now, of course, it may not last and everything, but I just think it's a, an interesting reassertion of the, of the power of the state and the ability of the state to regulate uh, businesses. And so it's, it's not automatic that um, that this uh, period will come to an end, but it's not automatic uh, that it will continue either, and that's uh, a very interesting development. Thank you. Lastly, I'd like to ask, what advice would you give to young academics? Well, I think uh, this is a great time to be a young academic because um, the whole methodology of political science and the social sciences is changing really rapidly and is particularly being transformed by the digital era. So it's never been um, quicker, it's never been easier to do research, to do you know, research that spans across continents, research that spans across a huge number of organizations. In the old days, you would have to trek round to lots of people with a tape recorder, and you would be lucky if you'd get you know, two good interviews done in a day. Now you can phone people up on Skype, you can get you know, five or six really good interviews done and recorded and you can record them in an electronic mode uh, so you can search them and so on. So I think the whole capabilities for doing policy-related research in the modern world are just you know, tremendously improved. And then also there are very much better means of disseminating and, and achieving impact with, with your findings. So I think you know, I'd encourage people to be ambitious, to scale up, to use a lot of electronic methods, to use fully electronic methods now. If you, you know, a lot of universities still operating in a kind of time warp from the 
70s or something like that. The same old methods. Similarly, you know, don't necessarily think you have to do samples. You can often do a complete census of organizations using websites and things like that. So I, th those are the kind of things I would, I would strongly stress to people. Be ambitious, be electronic, be digital in your methods, and uh, you, you should be able to grip much bigger issues than in the past and get much better results, and then analyze them much more comprehensively and authoritatively as well. Given what you've just said, do you think the digital era makes governments and authorities more accountable? I think the digital era, as in every other era, is ambivalent. Um, on the one hand, uh, you know, you can see these paranoid Hollywood movies in which the state can uh, exercise minute surveillance over every aspect of people's lives. And there is something in that. There has been a huge capacity uh, expansion within the state to handle information, to process information, and to get uh, implications. And it, that's also extending into areas like digital warfare and um, um, uh, remote surveillance, robotic armed forces, and so forth, all of which, as we know from the Terminator movies, are very scary areas for the state to be in. But at the same time, you know, uh, the digital era empowers a huge range of voices that would would have occurred solely in private. Nobody else would have been able to access those voices. Um, and uh, you know, with with modern social media, a lot of people can access these voices, and there can be a lot of a lot more sifting, and a lot more rapid and uh, intense citizen scrutiny of what government is doing. So some things make the possibility of a, a, an ever more intensive surveillance state loom larger and, and more imminently. And other things redress the balance.